Okay guys, in this video segment we're going to talk about the first law of thermodynamics and how we use a process called calorimetry to actually solve for problems within the first law of thermodynamics. So if we take a look at this first law, what the first law tells us is that if you put two different substances together in a system and you insulate that system so energy can't escape to the surroundings, if those two substances are not at equal temperature, they will move to equal temperature. And as they move to equal temperature, the energy that one of the substances gains will equal the energy that the other one loses. Okay? So if you can imagine pouring hot water in with cold water, the hot water is going to cool down, the cold water is going to warm up, and the amount of energy that the hot water loses will equal the amount of energy that the cold water gains in that process. Okay. Now, mathematically speaking, when we set these two equations equal to each other, we had to add one little piece to that puzzle. Okay. So we had to say that the energy gain is equal to the energy lost, but we had to put a negative sign in. And if you think about it, it makes sense with the stuff we've been doing. Because we know that, that our energy gained equaling energy lost well, energy loss is always a negative value. Energy gained is always a positive value. So a positive can't equal a negative. So we add an additional negative sign to that. So we have a negative with a negative, which then makes a positive. Okay. Now also, looking in this equation, if we look at it, it doesn't give us a lot of useful information. But if we recall one thing, that energy can also be represented by the letter Q, or energy change, I should say, can be represented by the letter Q. So we could say that the change in energy gained equals the change in energy lost. So we could say that Q equals Q. Again, putting our negative sign in to make the math work out. And then, because our Q values are equal, and we're dealing with two different substances. If we're in a lab setting, we're actually going to measure masses, temperatures, specific heat capacities, that kind of stuff. So we can expand this one more step, and we can say that for substance 1 versus substance 2, that the mass times its specific heat capacity times its change in temperature, which is temperature final minus temperature initial, should equal the mass of substance 2 times its specific heat capacity times its temperature change. Okay. Now one thing we tend to do, is because we have two different substances, is to use some subscripts to help denote that. So mass of substance 1, specific heat capacity of substance 1, initial temperature for substance 1, mass of substance 2, specific heat of substance 2, initial temperature for substance 2. Now notice, I did not put a 1 or a 2 on the temperature final. I did that for a reason. In any type of experiment, if these two things are going to be equal to each other, the energy gained by one, energy lost by the other, when they come equal to each other, that means they're at thermal equilibrium from the second law of thermodynamics. So if they're at thermal equilibrium, that means your temperature final will always be the same. So always have the same temperature final. So there isn't just two de temperature finals. There's only one temperature final that we're going to get when we work with this equation. Now also, don't forget, we had a negative sign here. So we want to make sure we bring that negative sign down. And at this side of the equation, we have to have a negative with it. So we can factor that into our math also. Okay. Now, this is your equation. The process by which we actually do this work is called calorimetry. Okay. Calorimetry is the actual physical lab setup that we do. Uh, calorimeters come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of the most simple ones are what we call coffee cup calorimeters, which you see in the picture here, where you just take two coffee cups, styrofoam coffee cups, put them together, insulate it, thermometer, way to stir it, and this makes actually a really good insulating calorimeter. Okay? So this process of calorimetry is to quantitatively measure these heat changes. So we're actually going to take down measurements of mass and temperature and so forth. Okay? Because of the first law of thermodynamics, we can actually be able to solve for different values that are unknown by using this process. So we're going to move over to a calorimetry applet now to kind of give you an idea of what we've been talking about. 
So if you take a look at this, this is a metal calorimeter. Uh, we have a little fan here to stir it, a little outlet to go into a temperature sensor. And we're just going to pick some different metals. So I'm going to pick, let's say, silver. So we have a chunk of silver. And I'm going to use a lot of silver. And I'm going to make it really hot. I'm going to keep my water small and my temperature really low for water because I want a big difference in temperature. The reason why I want to use a little bit of water is because water specific heat capacity is 4.18. Silver is 0.234. So it's going to take a lot of silver to change water's temperature. So I want to use as much silver as I can, as hot as I can, so we see the biggest temperature change. Okay? So if I start this experiment, put the silver in, into the water, it's turning, and we see the graph start to build. Now, on this graph, make a note that it's measuring the temperature of the water only inside of here. So we really can't track the temperature of the silver um, because there's nothing attached to that to read its temperature. So as a result, all we see is one graph. However, if you were to be graphing the silver, what you sh would see is you'd see a second line coming down. If you follow my cursor, it'd be coming down, 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 down. And where the water flat lines, it would also flat line and come across at equilibrium with the water. That flat line would be the point at which we've reached equilibrium and the point at which the energy has all been transferred between the two substances. Um, now this is silver slope, if we take a look at that. If we close that and we reset this graph and then we take a look at, uh, let's say, iron instead, we're going to use the exact same setup, same temperature, same amount of iron, same amount of water, and then if we start this experiment, we notice that the slope of the line is a little bit different here for iron. So with the silver, our slope was a little bit flatter. Uh, we didn't have quite as steep of a slope. With the iron, we see a much steeper slope. We still end up getting a flat line here at the end. Okay. Now what this tells us is that because the iron is able to change water's temperature more, it has to have a bigger specific heat capacity. And if we look, sure enough, that makes sense because its specific heat capacity is 0.452 versus the water at 4.18. And if you recall, silver was like a 0.2 something. So we should see a slope that's twice as steep here for that. Now you can do that with any type of combination of metal to, to water is actually graph and calculate the changes that happen in energy using calorimetry. If we go back into our... Um, presentation now, we want to be able to take and practice this through a practice problem. Okay, So here's our setup. We have 25 grams of water at 99.9 .9 degrees Celsius. So that's inside this calorimeter cup right here, this coffee cup. We also have an unknown mass of aluminum at 20 degrees Celsius. So we don't know aluminum's mass. Uh, we know it's at 20 degrees Celsius, but for some reason we can't, we can't measure the mass of the aluminum. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take the aluminum and put it into the calorimeter seal it up, and we're going to let the, those two things come to thermal equilibrium. So the water has to cool down, the aluminum has to warm up, and at the end, once they've done that, the combined system temperature is going to be 65.3 degrees Celsius. Okay, So we have all the pieces of the puzzle, and now what we need to do is set up the equation and actually solve it. Okay, So let me, set, let me help you set it up, and then you'll go ahead and, and solve the process, and then we'll take a look at the answer key um, here in a minute. So here's our setup. We know we have this basic equation we're working with. So our substance 1 versus our substance 2 is really water or aluminum. So I'm going to use an AL for aluminum and a W for water to designate that. So the aluminum is warming up, so I tend to make that the first one. So we have the mass of aluminum, the specific heat capacity of aluminum, and the initial temperature for the aluminum. Remember, temperature file is the same for both. And then we have the mass of water used, specific heat capacity of water, and the temperature initial for the water. Okay? So we should have all the variables we need. The only thing that we don't know is the mass of aluminum. So that's our unknown. Okay? Specific heat capacity for the aluminum if we think about it, that number is 0.897. Okay? So this is something you would look up on a table, or maybe is, is a number that you could get off of a, a word problem, but it's a number that we would have to look up. So we have 0.897 
joules per gram times degrees Celsius. The temperature final is given to us as the combined system. So at the end, we have 65.3 degrees Celsius. The initial temperature for the aluminum was given in the problem. That was 20 degrees Celsius. The mass of the water was given in the problem. We had 25 grams. Specific key capacity of water, that's a number you should put to memory. That's 4.18 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. Temperature final is the same as this. And temperature initial for the water is 99.9 .9 degrees Celsius. Okay, so even though there's a lot of variables here, we know all the pieces of the puzzle. The only one we're missing is the mass of the aluminum. So now we need to plug our numbers in and solve for the mass of the aluminum. Okay, so go ahead and do that. Rearrange the equation and solve, and then we'll come back and give you the answer key in a second. Okay, so now that we're ready to go, um, if you take a look, here's all our work put together. We have the concept of first law of thermodynamics here, E initial minus E final, Q equaling E. We combine them and we get this entire equation. I rearranged the equation first, and then I plugged all my numbers in, and I solved and I got 89 grams for the mass of the aluminum. If you, end up, if you ever end up with a negative mass or a negative specific heat capacity, it's probably because you forgot to carry your negative through your process. Okay, so that's one thing to check if you do run into that problem for um, for these pro for these problems. What we're going to do now is I'm actually going to shift to a different video clip of an in-class calorimetry lab demonstration that I did, and a student shot for me on their phone, and we're going to add it to this video to show you the actual process done as in a lab demonstration. Thank you.